Whitey Bulger is untouchable. The cops seem powerless. This guy would put a bullet in your head without any remorse at all. For 20 years, Whitey Bulger is secretly protected by rogue FBI agents. If the law enforces other law breakers, then the whole system fails. In a barrage of bullets and blood, James Whitey Bulger's Irish mob weaves a web of corruption, double cross, and murder that rocks Boston to its core. Boston, Massachusetts, May 11, 1982, early evening. In a waterfront bar, Brian Halloran, a small-time hood, is having dinner with an associate. Familiar with the city's Irish-American mobsters, he's being watched, but not by the cops. A young man named Kevin Weeks keeps Halloran under surveillance. I was in the lookout car. I called the hit in. Halloran and Weeks both work for Irish-American gangster James Whitey Bulger. We were looking for uh, Brian Helm for a while. He was cooperating with the FBI, I believe, on a couple of murders, saying that uh, Jim Bulger committed them. Ratting to the cops is unforgivable. Bulger plans to make an example of Halloran. Basically, what he was sending the message is, if you're going to uh, cooperate against me, I'm going to kill you. Weeks is equipped with binoculars and a CB radio. I picked up the walkie-talkie and I let him know that he was coming out. I knew that somewhere down the line there would be violence, you know, more than beating people up and stuff. But when that comes, you're never totally prepared for it. Bulger and a trigger man screech into the lot. Jim Bulger shot him with a 30 caliber carbine and with a machine gun from the back seat. The driver was dead instantly. Panic-stricken witnesses dive for cover. Kevin Weeks looks on as Brian Halloran staggers out of the car. Brian Halloran was still alive. He got out and started walking backwards. Jim Bulger just took the rifle and started pumping bullets into him. For Weeks, the Halloran murder is a rite of passage. It makes him a full-fledged member of Whitey Bulger's inner circle. At that point, I realized my life had changed, that there was no going back. So I decided, well, if I'm going to be a criminal, I'm going to be the best criminal I can. In the 1980s, Boston is no stranger to gangland slaying. For decades, rival mobs control the city's rackets. The main Irish gangs are in Somerville and Charlestown. The Italian mafia dominates the old North End district. But Whitey Bulger gets his start in the lowest reaches of the city's underworld, far to the south. South Boston, an area locally known as Southie, is a cramped grid dominated by three Depression-era housing projects. 40% of Boston's population is of Irish heritage. The city was the first in America to hold an annual St. Patrick's Day parade. In Southie, Boston's Irish Catholic heart beats strong. South Boston was predominantly a, uh, an Irish ghetto, and it was just a very uh, insular area. Nobody ever, uh, ever went over into South Boston unless they were from South Boston. Southie is a poor neighborhood, but some managed to prosper. During the 1960s, Bulger's brother Billy is an ambitious local Democrat. By the 80s, He's the state senate president with political links that reach as far as Washington, D.C. Yet Billy still lives in South Boston, staying close to his roots and close to his criminal brother. The Bulger brothers live in a world where people aspire to a simple code. Look after your own. Stand up for yourself. Disputes are settled by the fist. Men are expected to fight. It wasn't a matter of the fact that you had to win every fight, but you did have to show up. In this tough environment, Whitey Bulger stands out as tougher than most. He served a seven-year stretch in Alcatraz for armed robbery, but he's a big fish in a small pond. During the 60s, the Southie area is barely on the radar of the Mafia, 
and the main Irish gangs in Somerville and Charlestown. In the North End, the Mafia dominates the city's organized crime. From here, Mafia underboss Jerry Angiulo and his consigliere Larry Zanino take a cut from the scams run by other gangs. Crime in Southie is small time. But even here, gangsters still have to pay a street tax to the Mafia. Competing street gangs run nickel and dime gaming and protection rackets. Whitey Bulger is an enforcer and debt collector for one of them. But Bulger's gang has rivals. Seen here in a rare and battered old photograph, a cocky young group of robbers, among them, Pat Nee. We were thieves. We like to steal and we like to party. And we might make enough money on one score to last two or three months. But while we were out partying, we'd always be looking for the next, for the next one. Nee's gang operates in the South Boston docks in what is now known as the Conley Terminal. One of their specialties is raiding parked trucks full of the daily catch. A lot of money in doing fish and crab meat. A lot of money in items that are sold every day. Goods that are consumed every day. That's what you would like to steal. One night in July 1969, Nee's men are celebrating a successful heist when a drunken brawl breaks out with some of Bulger's gang members. By chance, both Nee and Bulger are in another bar nearby when they hear what's happening. The two, soon to be rivals, share a ride to the fight. And we pulled up. Me and Whitey just kind of looked at each other. I said, well, it's the last time we'll be talking on this level. See you later. And he said, see you later. Then uh, the shooting started. The war lasts from 1969 to 72. At first, it's Nee's gang who are on the receiving end, dodging Bulger's bullets in a deadly game of cat and mouse. But the war turns ugly when Nee's brother is murdered by a Bulger associate. When Peter got killed, I decided I could kill. And I started hunting. An ex-Marine with combat experience in Vietnam, Nee tracks his target with cold-blooded vengeance. One cold and wet night in November 1969, Nee finally confronts his brother's killer. I finally trapped him coming home. I creeped up the alleyway as he's parking. And then when he turned around, I said, well, it's your turn, you And I opened up on him. Turns out I shot him over the heart, under the heart, blew out his right lung. Uh, I think I hit him twice in the stomach. I thought I hit him in the heart. And when he went down, I kicked his teeth out and I spit on him. Incredibly, Nee's target survives. But now Bulger knows that rival gangster Pat Nee is a dangerous opponent. As war is breaking out among Irish gangs in South Boston, to the north, another Irish gang war is ending. The Somerville district of Winter Hill plays host to Boston's biggest Irish mob. But this suburb is besieged by rival gangsters from neighboring Charlestown. At stake, lucrative bookmaking and extortion rackets. Howie Winter is the leader of the Winter Hill Gang from during the late 1960s. Your life wasn't worth much in those days, you know? I mean, most of us had a mindset that we were not going to survive too long, you know? By the early 1970s, the war has cost over 40 lives from both gangs. Myself and a couple other guys were all that was left, really, you know? Most everybody else was deceased. As one of the few survivors, Winter claims the leadership of all Boston Irish gangs, but he's short of manpower. In 1972, Whitey Bulger offers to step into the breach and join forces with Winter. But first, he asks Winter to help him make peace with his rival, Pat Nee. With Howie Winter as benefactor, Nee and Bulger sit down together for the first time in two years. We met, and uh, we didn't shake hands. We sat down at the same table, and we started talking. 
We decided to end the hostilities between ourselves at that uh, point. Bulger proposes that he and Nee team up and split South Boston's rackets between them. They would pay Howie Winter a share of their take, and he in turn would pay the Mafia. In the name of peace, Nee goes along with the plan. We took everything over. We went around to all the bookies, all the loan sharks, and said, you now work for us. Local boxing gyms supply Whitey Bulger with young new recruits, expanding his operation. And his job is made unexpectedly easier when violence suddenly erupts on the streets of South Boston. Boston, the mid-1970s. Fledgling kingpin James Whitey Bulger builds a criminal power base in South Boston. But then, a bombshell rocks the Southie community. In June 1974, a federal judge orders a forced integration of Boston schools. Black and white children are bused to different neighborhoods. It's a noble experiment in equality of opportunity. But in Southie, busing ignites hostility. You do not give the right of any minority by sacrificing the right of a majority. It was a matter of fact that, you know, you were born and brought up in South Boston. You had neighborhood schools that were two, three blocks away from you. I have to leave my school so they can come in. No, it's not happening. South Boston erupts in protest. For some, busing is a turning point into a life of crime. Kevin Weeks graduates from South Boston High, just as busing begins. In September 1974, he takes a job as a security aide at his old school, but soon gets sucked into the violence. You know, I was supposed to be breaking up the fights, but when there was a fight, I was right in the middle of it, you know, helping my friends. Weeks stands by his friends and ends up in court, charged with assault. The case is dismissed, but as he leaves court, Weeks is spotted by Billy O'Neill, a local bar owner. And uh, that's when my life took on a whole different uh, meaning. Kevin Weeks is soon working as a bouncer at O'Neill's bar, then called Triple O's. It's an establishment frequented by James Bulger. Jim Bulger took an interest in me because of all the fights I was having. And, uh, you know, police would come in and I always just, uh, you know, held my own with them, you know, kept my mouth shut and uh, took care of whatever business I had. During the mid 70s, Bulger begins using Weeks as extra muscle in his shakedowns. Together, they ruthlessly extort money from local bookmakers, all on behalf of Howie Winter. Boston's biggest Irish mobster. There was a bookmaker almost in every barroom in those days. And they'd book the horses during the daytime and they'd take the numbers. And then at the nighttime, they'd, uh, they'd take the dogs. You know? One shakedown tactic is to create a problem, then offer a solution. Creating a problem is very easy to do. You know, if someone owned a bar or something, you know, you'd have people going and smash up the bar. <laughs> you know, you go to people and afterwards and tell them, listen, uh, so-and-so was trying to kill you. They offered us 100000 to kill you. But if, you know, if you want, you can pay us and they won't bother you anymore. And they always paid. So we would create the problem and solve the problem. And there really was no problem. The problem was us. Bulger and Weeks work at night and out of sight. Their victims are usually members of the criminal fraternity. By helping Bulger prey on local criminals, Weeks rapidly accumulates a sizable fortune. It's like a, uh, a bucket. You put it out in the rain, and eventually all those little drops